Well, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I don't know where you're joining us from, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We do have a, a little bit of a problem, but we're going to go ahead and get started anyway. Uh, again, I want to welcome you to today's uh, presentation on connecting science and practice. This is going to be uh, a discussion on uh, what the science of reading talks about good practices, and we're going to connect <clears throat> that to a program called Reading Horizons Discovery. <clears throat> By way of introduction, my name is Matt Chrisman, and I'm a national trainer and a certified product specialist <clears throat> excuse me, with Reading Horizons. And for 26 years, I've been providing professional development and implementation support in the use of high impact methods and strategies uh, for uh, learners of, at every age. Uh, today's presentation, we're also going to be joined a little bit later by Judy Kulang, who is a guest speaker who will come in and join us at the end and uh, give us her experiences on Reading Horizons and her practices in using the science of reading. Um, today, we're going to look at, uh, if you'll bear with me, we're having some technical problems here, so bear with me here. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about, as far as our agenda, what is the science of reading? We're going to be looking at the science of reading and what we now know is necessary to prepare for the academic rig rigors that students will encounter. And I'm also going to be introducing to you a simple but powerful strategies that utilize an evidence-based approach. And then we're going to be discussing how these resources can be made available to you that so every learner can um, benefit from the combination of the science of reading and evidence-aligned instruction. Finally, we're going to end the session with our, uh, with our guest speaker who's going to be speaking about her experiences with Reading Horizons. And Throughout this process, um, before we get into this today, I want you to know that there will be um, an opportunity for you to post your chat questions. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end to discuss um, your questions. And throughout the process, we're also going to be looking at um, polls that will be popping up. And we want you to use those polls because that helps us to get an understanding of where you are, um, your understanding of these concepts, and helps us to frame our message a little bit. Now, look, our Big ideas, we want to talk about some of the big ideas that support this agenda today. First of all, we want to explore how the brain responds to reading instruction. And we want to connect the science of reading to good practices. But starting out by identifying a, an, an essential goals, we want to ensure that every young learner has the opportunity to develop adequate reading skills that allow them to reach their full academic potential. And in supporting this goal, there are some big ideas that we are going to cover. Number one, that reading is not a natural process, that it must be taught. Two, it's not, all, not only what we teach, but how it's taught that can make a profound difference. Also, our mandate is to create an independent lifelong learner. That's the mandate of every, learn, of every instructor. And we want to do that through the gift of literacy, because students cannot learn, cannot be a lifelong learner if they struggle with literacy. And finally, everyone can learn to read regardless of their condition. So here's where our first poll comes into play. We'd like you to identify how comfortable you are with the concept of structured literacy. So as that poll comes up. Matt, can you just make me the host? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I can. Um, okay. Um, this is where we're having some technical problems here. Yeah, Sorry. Just click on my name and make host. Okay, there you go. There we go. Here. So how comfortable you are with structured literacy? And we're gonna post the results of this. So we'd ask you please to respond. Okay, so the responses have been pretty good. It sounds like most of you are either very comfortable or somewhat comfortable, and, and about a fourth of you would like to learn more about structured literacy. Awesome, thank you. Now, we'd also like to put up another poll, and I'd like to you to identify the areas that you see your students really struggling with when it comes to reading. Okay. 
We can also look at this from this from the instructor's perspective. What do you struggle with when instructing in foundational reading? Okay, so the response is um, pretty overwhelming. Over half of the group, as you can see, applying what they've learned in isolation uh, to reading fluency. So it looks like the transfer of skill in isolation to connected text is a big issue and also sounding out words they're not familiar with. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for responding. Thank you very much. So where are we as a nation? Where are we as a nation? The NAP score, oh, excuse me, um, the NEP score, which is the only consistent testing that we have nationally, it's a broad indicator of what we are doing when it comes to reading. And this source, this is a source that we have that has scoring data that goes back as far as 1992. And as of 2019, here's where we stand that only 35% of our fourth graders are at or above reading proficiency, and only 34% of eighth graders are at or above reading proficiency. And there's actually been a decline as the student gets older. What's more distressing is that reading scores have actually dropped since uh, 2017, which is our last national data set. What's also distressing is that there's been limited progress on this front since testing started in 1992, despite a national referendum to improve and fund literacy. Since we continue to teach reading, but we're not seeing the expected growth, we're being forced to reevaluate how we teach reading, especially given all the research that's forming our approach to applying the science of reading. The NAP score supports research conducted by Dr. Jean Chow of Harvard University, in which she was able to identify what is termed the plateau effect or the fourth grade slump. Now her research showed that a significant percentage of students that begin to plateau at or around the fourth grade, and they seem to be able to get to the fourth grade, but struggle to move beyond it. And the question is why? In the 26 years I've worked with, uh, with programs, with instructors and administrators around the country, this is a common, it's a current, a common occurrence. And the question is, why do students seem to get stuck between the fourth and sixth grade? Well, in order to answer that question, let's look at what the difference is between early reading, K through three reading, and what reading looks like in grades four plus. Early students are developing print sound correspondences, learning word attack strategies with CVC words, simple sight words are applied with decodable text. And during this learning to read stage, elementary reading is controlled. For many students, they're able to mask distresses by memorizing words, allowing them to appear on level, when in fact they may have distresses that in, will impact their reading later on. Later on, however, in the grades four plus, this is typically what we call the reading to learn stage. As students move beyond inspectional reading, they are expected to engage in analytical and syntopical reading. This engagement requires that the students have a strong underlying phonologic foundation that allows them to handle larger words and a greater volume of language. So for students who struggle, the words are coming at them too fast, they're too big for those early compensatory strategies to work. There are just simply too many holes at the foundational level. As such, they begin to stagnate. So it's clear that something is occurring at the K through three level that we need to address. Now, it's important to know that reading is not a natural process. Our brain is not developed to read. Brain, our brain is actually wired for speech and not for reading. And we're gonna investigate this more in a little bit. But having said that, our brain is a pattern absorbing organ. It has the capacity to recognize musical, mathematical, and even orthographic patterns, which is what our language is. Now our brain can pick up basic reading skills even when they're not explicitly taught. So we now know from research that about 60% of us will learn to attain a certain level of reading regardless of what is taught and how it is, and how it is taught. But 40% of us won't. And it's important that reading is not a natural process. So our brain is wired for speech. So what we now know that how these students ultimately fare, this 40% is profoundly affected by the reading program they are subjected to. As I stated earlier, we know from brain science we know that from brain science that the brain is not a natural reading organ. It has to be taught. So as we stated earlier, we know that, uh, that students need explicit instruction in order to acquire the skills they need to read. So reading and writing are recent developments. And though the spoken language is hardwired into the brain, the human brain is not a reading brain. 
the neural circuitry necessary for reading is actually created through instruction. So efficient readers have a well-developed neural pathway connecting the phonologic module to the word form module, or, or, and this is where the sound symbol connection is made. This is the network that must be developed so that there's automaticity in those print sounds concepts needed for efficient reading. Reading and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, struggling readers do not have a well-developed neural network in the left hemisphere of the brain, which is why, which is the part of the brain that's, west, that's best suited for reading. And the lack of these networks actually intensifies activation of the right hemisphere of the brain, which is the area of the brain that's not well suited for reading. The three-step process, uh, cueing process of memorize a pattern, look at a picture, guess at a word, which is very common in reading instruction, actually reinforces the area of the brain that's not well suited for reading. A highly structured approach that's grapheme, phoneme focused actually sparks more optimal brain circuitry than word memorization. So as learners are able to build and reinforce these networks using a combination of receptive and expressive activity, mental orthographic images or orthographic mapping occurs. As Dr. Kilpatrick states, it is the process that readers use to store written words for immediate effortless retrieval. It's the means by which readers turn unfamiliar words into familiar, instantaneously accessible sight words. Orthographic mapping is not a visual process. We do not store and retrieve words visually. So through every step in this process involves some level of phonograph, uh, phonologic integration, which is why simple word memorization simply is not an effective approach. Now, we're gonna pull up another poll here. Knowing that I'd like to know what you know about dyslexia. So if you can respond to this poll, there are three questions about dyslexia. And Erica, I'd like you to post, we're gonna post the results of this poll as soon as it comes up. Okay. All right, a lot of you got the right answers. Awesome, let's look down. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. I'm gonna close this poll here. Reading instruction is critical when it comes to dyslexic learners. So let's see if you got this right. Approximately 20% of the population has characteristics of dyslexia. 80% of students with a learning disability have dyslexia. Dyslexic learners have limited left brain activation occurring when they read. And the way in which they read, actually the way in which reading is taught will either reinforce the neural pathways in the left side of the brain or it will reinforce the neural pathways in the right side of the brain, so which is not well suited. Since dyslexic learners tend to be at or above normal intelligence, we can literally overcome dyslexia if we apply right instructional approaches or practices. And we know that the brain can be remapped at any age. However, if good instruction is applied from the beginning, and that's primarily in the K-1 level, we can dramatically minimize the opportunity for academic deficits as a result of limited reading skills, especially as they move into upper elementary and into the middle school. Excellent. So what is evidence-aligned instruction? The method or approaches that have been found through research to give students the instruction in reading such that these students can develop adequate reading skills commensurate with their ability. As I indicated earlier, reading is not a natural process. Instruction is critical. So what is changing is the approach used to teach reading and the insights into the process of reading, which is gathered from research across many disciplines, including developmental psychology, um, developmental linguistics, cognitive neuropsychology, and intervention research. There is a plethora of empirical research that supports the findings on learning to read and how to teach reading. Effective word storage and word retrieval or automaticity and word recognition is essential to skilled reading. Research is clear, right brain-based instruction is not efficient. Moreover, for older learners, being able to access more language more quickly is essential. Did you know that there are over 170,000 words in English? Every subject has its own grammar. How are learners expected to effectively address all of this language 
applying left brain learning? And the answer is a structured approach that actually breaks the code of English. In other words, can the students decode? Another term for decoding is word attack. Struggling readers have ineffective word attack strategies, which impedes fluency and ultimately impacts comprehension. And we're going to look at this a bit later, but Guff and Tomner posited a theoretical model on the process of reading and learning to read. Reading comprehension is a product of word recognition, which is decoding, and language comprehension, which is listening. What is important is that the, it's a product and not just a sum. As such, it's not just teaching, decoding, and then layering in language comprehension. This can be demonstrated mathematically. So if one represents full capacity and zero represents no capacity, you can see that language comprehension alone does not give rise to reading comprehension. Likewise, some value less than one but greater than zero will also impact reading comprehension. So this model demonstrates that both decoding and language comprehension are equally important to understanding text. <clears throat> so let's frame the simple view of reading around instructional priorities. As a reader is learning the language structure, a majority of their working memory or brain energy is committed to that part of the equation. So instructional intensity must focus on developing and automatizing those skills so that brain energy can shift toward thinking our way through text, which is comprehension. Scarborough's writ illustration identifies the subset skills for each of the component in Tumner's model. And as these skills are combined in more interactive ways, one becomes a more skilled reader. So what is essential to understand is that the cognitive bandwidth that readers need for comprehension is actually made available through automaticity and decoding, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> or word identification. For older learners, this becomes a challenge, which is preparing the mind to handle more advanced texts. For the root issue tends to be phonologic, which is decoding, and ultimately comprehension is affected. So now that we know that the answer is rooted in instruction and must be included in both the adjustment in what we teach and how we teach it, let's look at a simple model that integrates all the parts of the brain <clears throat> involved in reading. <clears throat> this simple model illustrates how instruction should simultaneously engage the sensory inputs of listening and reading with the motor outputs of speaking and writing. <clears throat> the two base processors, when engaged concurrently, reinforce decoding, which is reading and encoding spelling. Meaning is attached for vocabulary building, and from there, the capacity is available to apply <clears throat> what we call the context processor, which is comprehension. When the three base processors are successfully engaged, automaticity at this level allows the mental energy to shift to context or comprehension <clears throat> instruction. So let's apply this knowledge to the primary components of evidence-aligned instruction. <clears throat> In 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, a groundbreaking study was released by the National Reading Panel. And in the 20 years since its release, subsequent research has only served to reinforce its findings. The NRP identifies five <clears throat> primary components of reading that should be taught, practiced, and applied. <clears throat> now, I've identified these components in a pyramid to illustrate the foundational characteristics of each component in reinforcing the next level. Moreover, like a pyramid, you always build from the bottom up. So a bottom-up approach is essential to successful reading instruction and is supported by <clears throat> other evidence-based approaches, such as Bloom's taxonomy. Now, the foundation for reading begins with phonemic awareness. In fact, it's been identified as the primary component for reading success. Phonemic awareness is the identification and manipulation of sounds. Our language consists of phonemes and graphemes. Our ability to map sounds to symbols and form words is at the basis of reading. <clears throat> Strength in phonemic awareness gives rise to phonologic awareness or decoding. Word attack strategies are developed that allow us to develop those MOIs or mental orthographic images that promote the automaticity in word, uh, in word identification. So strength in these two areas leads to this key measure we call fluency. So fluency has three components, accuracy, rate, and prosody. All three must be demonstrated for fluency. Strong fluency allows us to aggressively address vocabulary and print, and the combination of all this learner's ability to acquire these vocabulary skills actually reinforces our ability to address aggressively written and visual comprehension. <clears throat> so now we're going to do a new poll, and I'd like you, based on what we've just now know, I'd like you to <clears throat> identify if you have seen these signs of decoding distress in your learners.
Um, if, if you've seen um, signs of distress, put it in the chat box. This, we don't have this poll right now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> Another technical snafu. So things like, for instance, um, are they skipping over words? Are they substituting words they know for words they do not know? Uh, do you see significant segmentation when reading? Very, we call them the machine gun readers, where they just are heavily segmenting. Um, doing a lot of, are they still using pictures for comprehension? These are all signs of decoding distresses. And I see, thank you for your responses in the chats. A lot of great responses here. Guessing on onset, yes, substituting words, not blending words. Very good, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, you, for some reason, we have the wrong yeah, they, polls. They, they answered that question um, in the previous one. Oh, got it, okay, yeah. very good. All right, no worries, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so connecting the science of reading to practice is what we call structured literacy. And this illustration by the International Dyslexia Association identifies the components of structured literacy in a high packed reading environment. This illustration identifies what must be taught, which is those, which is that inner circle, and how it must be taught, which is the outer circle. We're gonna start with explicit instruction. Ex instruction must be explicitly taught. And distilled, this means that every skill is, is addressed clearly and not left open for, di for discovery. Instruction is planned and executed in a highly sequential schema, building from a simple to complex with ongoing opportunity for reinforcement and application. And instruction must be targeted. Instructional branching is provided based on learner response and application. And this means that diagnostics are essential. Instructors, should, uh, instructors rather should be using daily observational data to target distress and maintain an appropriate challenge level. So knowing that, what are the four keys to effective instruction? Now we've covered three of these. Let's review. Concepts are explicitly taught. Concept, uh, concepts are systematically taught, connected and reinforced not only in reading, but in spelling, speaking and writing. The Bloom's instructional model must be applied daily and across the scope and sequence of instruction. And finally, we need to apply multimodal instructional strategies where we can. I'd like to investigate this final point in more detail. What does multi-sensory instruction look like? Early in the presentation, we discussed how important an active and robust neural network that connects the phonologic module with the orthographic module in the brain is. Again, these networks are critical to orthographic mapping needed for automaticity and fluency. So instruction must promote and reinforce the development of these neural pathways. And this can be accomplished by applying what we call multimodal instructional strategies. This process actually activates and connects all the areas of the brain involved in accurate and fluent reading by simultaneously engaging visual, auditory, and kinetic activity. Instructors engage the phonologic module or phonologic loop and the orthographic loop in the brain concurrently as students see something, as they say something, as they hear it, as they write it, and as they read it. Distressed readers typically have one or more of these components in distress. And notice that at the conclusion of the process, there's what we call a targeted response by the instructor. Structured literacy requires ongoing diagnostic, and this process is diagnostic in its application, allowing the instructor to provide corrective feedback at the moment the distress is observed. So, now that we've identified what and why, let's shift our discussion to how. How can we quickly and effectively automatize word identification and immediately apply or transfer it to reading? I'd like to introduce you to a program that connects the science to the practice. Reading Horizons Discovery is a program that effectively develops the foundation for reading success. It's based on a scientifically validated approach, meeting the mandates of effective instruction and decoding, spelling, pronunciation, and reading strategies for learners that are K through three. Discovery combines professional development with teacher-led instruction and interactive software and is based on Orton Gillingham principles of instruction, which has been shown completely effective with learners at the beginning stages of reading, <clears throat> but essential for those who struggle with language processing disorders. Since our approach drives the efficacy of this program, I'd like to introduce you to this approach and demonstrate how this method aligns with evidence-based learning and the science of reading. 
Reading comprehension, as we know, is predicated on automaticity of word recognition. So how do you automatize word recognition? Now, we talked about the traditional three-step approach in cueing, which research is widely used, which is actually right brain based, is not very effective. We're actually going to introduce a different approach that drives the automaticity in word identification through a pattern approach. So <clears throat> since it's unrealistic to expect learners to memorize tens of thousands of words, we want to uh, develop an effective approach that teaches the patterns that apply to tens of thousands of words. The Reading Horizons approach teaches the 42 sounds produced in the English language and the spelling patterns that produce those sounds and teaches seven primary orthographic patterns that apply to 89% of commonly used English. Five address monosyllabic words <clears throat> and two decoding skills address multisyllabic words. These key core skills highlight the simplicity of the framework to prepare students for accelerated instruction in vocabulary and comprehension. So we now know it's not just me, what we teach, but how it's taught that can make the difference between success and failure. So our method is based in Orton Gillingham principles instruction, which has again been proven highly effective with learners of all ages, <clears throat> but essential with those that have language processing disorders. So automatizing word recognition is accelerated through a process uh, utilizing a unique marking system. This marking approach, along with the process used to prove words, helps students to identify the patterns of English that determine the pronunciation and meaning of words. There are only nine marks used consistently throughout the program, and at no time are all these marks used concurrently. As students are able to recognize and apply the patterns, the marks are dropped. Also, diacritical marks are only used at the feature level, which is at the letter, sound, bigram, and word level. This prompt fade approach automatizes the word recognition approach through patterns, and as those markings are dropped, as the students and learners apply these patterns to similar words, and as they move from the word level into the connected text stage. What makes this approach unique is the simplicity with which the skills are taught as students move from sounds into sentences. Skills are simple to teach, simple to learn, and quickly applied. We're going to begin the process with the alphabetic principle. For kindergarten, each letter is its, has its own lesson, but for first through third grade, the alphabet is either taught or reviewed in letter, in letter sets of four or five consonants and one vowel, five letter sets in all. These early lessons provide the foundation for more advanced concepts to come by developing those strong print sound concepts which are essential. When introducing each letter, students are able to map the name, the sound, and the formation. At this early stage, the objective is to begin the process of fluency, which is the facilitator to comprehension. And this is done within each letter group lesson as students combine a new consonant with a learned vowel sound we call a slide. Now, why is this concept essential? Well, let me ask you, which direction do we read in? Which direction do we write in? Developing and reinforcing directionality bilaterally, which is in reading and spelling, is essential to accelerating fluency. By sliding these two sounds, students are fluently moving from left to right visually, orally, and orthographically. Next, a consonant sound is added to form a word. The vowel is identified and marked, Students are able to write and speak the word fluently as word meaning and context sentences are used. Side words are introduced, allowing the student to connect words to sentences. And we also introduce nonsense words at the CBC level to uh, assess proficiency. This process is repeated with each new letter group and students will connect new sounds to previously learned sounds as they move from slides to words into sentences. And the systematic approach ensures the mastery of the alphabetic principle and the effective transfer to words and sentences. Now you may have noticed that exceptions are made to the alphabetic principle. This is done to address common issues regarding sound and spelling such as the similar sounds of I and E and the sound of Q with the letter U. I've highlighted an example of this in the CK spelling principle. C and K are the final two consonants in our last letter group. Since C and K both make the same sound, how do you know which letter starts a word? Did you know that spelling with C and K is determined by the vowel that follows? Did you know that K always takes I and E and C will take the other three? This is a 100% spelling pattern in the English language, which justifies leaving C and K for last because you can't spell with C and K until you have first mastered the medial vowel sound. Scaffolding, graduating from 
the alphabetic princes, uh, principal students are going to combine letters into blends, digraphs, special vowel combination, and other features that are common at this level. Now, the same process used to teach the alphabetic principle is applied to blends. Students are taught the feature and the associated marking, then move through the same sequence of slide, word building, and then sentence work. At this point, students are ready to extend the process into extended text or passage reading, and this is where comprehension instruction begins to intensify. Now, students are now ready to begin learning the orthographic patterns that determine how the vowel will sound. With few exceptions, consonants are very consistent. What's changing is the vowel. Did you know that we have 19 vowel sounds in English? We want to start with the patterns that determine when the vowel is going to be short or long. As students will learn, it always, it, it's what comes after the vowel that determines the impact of, this, of, this, of the sound on the vowel. So students have been applying a simple process of marking features under the word from left to right. In proving this pattern, students will now mark each feature under the word, but when they get to the end of the word, the eye and the hand will move around the word and continue the process of the vowel proof process up around the word. This vowel proof process is simple, it is sequential, and it is highly predictive. And the vowel proof process rapidly maps the five primary patterns used for single syllable words or for syllables and multisyllable words. And we're gonna look at each of these five patterns. Of the five patterns, we're going to start with the two short vowel patterns. We're going to start by identifying pattern number one. Pattern number one identifies the vowel as short because it is followed by a single guardian consonant, which forces the vowel to be short. You may know this as the closed syllable pattern. Pattern number two is similar to pattern number one, except that the vowel will be short because there are two guardian consonants that guard the vowel short. Of all the words in English, these are the only two patterns that define the short sound. Now we're gonna to move to the three long vowel patterns. The easiest of the three long vowel patterns is the vowel will be long because it is standing alone. Now you may know this as the open syllable type. Pattern number four is the vowel will be long. Why? Because there is a silent E. And pattern number five, we call the adjacent vowel pattern. The adjacent vowel pattern tells us when there are two vowels side by side or adjacent, the second vowel is silent and the first vowel is long. Okay, in short, these five basic phonetic skills allow the students to quickly recognize the patterns that indicate when the vowel is long and short within a word or syllable and serve as the foundation for literally breaking the code of English. Each skill is taught one at a time as students move from words to sentences to passages and the approach is consistent. Students are challenged with each skill to transfer what they've learned into reading. These five patterns are the core to the English structure. They impact inflectional suffixes, why is a vowel, single syllables, and multisyllabic words, as you will see shortly. Now we're going to do a simple skill combination. So students are able to do this. If you notice in this first example, we can determine that the vowel is long because it follows pattern number three, the vowel is standing alone. But if we take this word and we add a guardian to it, the pattern changes. Because there's a guardian constant, the vowel will be short. In our second example, we start by proving the vowel short because there's a guardian consonant. But if we drop the guardian, we have a new pattern. The vowel is standing alone, therefore it will be long. In our last example, we can prove the vowel long because it follows the silent E pattern. But if that E is dropped, that N suddenly becomes a guardian, and the job of a guardian is to guard the vowel short. Now, I'm also going to apply this to a, a, an interesting skill, which we call the jobs of why. As I indicated earlier, these five phonetic patterns are central to the structure of English. So an example of this is how we can apply this to when Y is a vowel. Did you know that Y, if Y does not start a word, it will be a vowel? And in single syllable words, the Y will take on this, the sound of vowel I. Now, with that knowledge, we can apply the five phonetic patterns to determine if the vowel is long or short, as I'll demonstrate now. In this first example, there is a guardian, which makes the Y take on the short I sound. In our second example, there are two guardians, which means that the Y will take on short I. In our third example, the vowel is standing alone, therefore Y will take on long I. In the fourth example, silent E makes vowel Y say long I. And in our last example, Y does not start a word, therefore it's a vowel, but it's coming at the end and it's adjacent to the first vowel. And we know from this pattern, that it will be silent that makes and making the first vowel long. 
Now, with this knowledge, students can progressively determine the sound and spelling of a word using these patterns. However, what happens when we turn a single syllable word into a multisyllabic word? First, students will learn that a syllable must have one working or heard vowel. When we have more than one working vowel, we have more than one syllable. Students are now going to learn two simple decoding skills <clears throat> to determine how a multisyllabic word is broken up into single syllables so that they can immediately apply those five phonetic patterns that we just learned. The first decoding skill students learn is that when there's a single consonant following the vowel, it cannot stay with that syllable. It must move on to the next syllable. In other words, one must run. Once we've identified the syllable, we can now apply our five phonetic patterns to establish the sound of the vowel. In the second syllable, again, we can apply, apply our five phonetic patterns to establish the sound of the vowel. The second and final decoding skill that students learn is what happens when there are two consonants that follow the vowel. When there are two consonants following the vowel, two must split. Again, once we've identified the syllable, we can then apply our five phonetic skills to establish the sound of the vowel for each subsequent syllable. So identifying syllable types in larger words will help students read more words more accurately, more fluently, and also aid in correct spelling. So now that we've done this, we're gonna do a little activity. Now, uh, normally in a, in a training, I would have the, the, uh, the group respond. In this particular case, I just want you to go ahead and quietly respond as we go through and we're gonna decode this together. I'm gonna to ask you a series of questions based on what we now know of the five phonetic patterns and two decoding skills. The first thing I'm gonna do is mark everything under the word from left to right. Then I want your eye to circle back to the very first syllable. It's that O, that's the syllable. And here's the question. Based on what we know, which decoding skill will we use to break this, to identify or, or um, set the syllable apart? Is it one must run or two will split? Well, if you said two were split, you were correct. Now, based on that, I want you to identify is the vowel long or short and why is the vowel long or short? Well, pulling in our card, we can see that there's a guardian, therefore the vowel will be short. Let's move to the next syllable. Which decoding skill are we applying? Now notice there are three consonants there, but the arc under the PL tells us that you cannot split that. Those two consonants must stay together. So therefore we have two units. We have the M and the PNL. Two will split. Now which vowel pattern are you going to apply? If you said number two, or excuse me, if you said number one, you are correct. There's a guardian which makes the vowel short. Now that we've done, isolated our final syllable, which vowel pattern do you see here? Obviously it's pattern number four silent E, and now we can decode that word. Although our approach is simple, the scope is comprehensive. These are all the additional skills that are introduced throughout the program. As students layer in new skills and continually reinforce these skills with activities, they can quickly um, expand their reach into all levels of English. Okay, now that we understand these simple patterns um, and we see how simple it is to decode um, the, the language from our simple framework. I wanna to talk to you about our instruction design. Most lessons can be taught in our program in under 30 minutes by an instructor. And our instructional design actually follows what we call the gradual release of responsibility approach, which most of you understand or all of you would understand. This process starts with a simple review, moves into a simple 10 minute instruction, which can be both soft, that can be driven by a software instructor and then goes into a 10 to 15 guided practice at the feature level using um, dictation, which we're gonna talk about. And then notice that at the end of the lesson, there is an immediate transfer to connected text for fluency and comprehension practice. So let's talk about the review and instruction. Now that, <clears throat> excuse me, discovery can be implemented in whole class, small group, and tiered instruction. So there is a narrow tutorial-based software lessons that can be used to support classroom instruction during lab time, or it can be used during differentiation. The instructor can also tether the digital lesson with the class instruction for a more interactive experience. From here, we're gonna move through, into, through our gradual release into what we call dictation. So following through this approach, the group, in the group stage, um, students are taken into what we call guided practice in the form of dictation. This is a stage where students are able to apply what they've learned at the feature level. This stage is highly interactive and engaging, allowing students to demonstrate their understanding of the concepts. 
Dictation serves as an informal formative assessment for instructors before we move to the reading stage. So instructors are using dictation to establish proficiency. The instructor is able to identify errors and offer immediate correction so that the error is not carried over into the reading stage. So now moving beyond that, we're now going to move into what we call a three-stage reading transfer process. Still within the group concept, we're going to, the group will be introduced to what we call a whole class transfer card. Whole class transfer card is projected on a screen and allows the student within that lesson to connect all the elements that they have been working on from skill and isolation down through a connect text, uh, text controlled vocabulary sentence. From there, the individual work will begin as students are handed what we call a skill transfer card. Every card is different, so every student has a different card, which gives students ample opportunities to practice spelling, pronunciation, and reading of words, slides, and sentences. Consumable worksheets are provided. These are materials that you do not purchase but are automatically included on our website. You can bring them in for in-class and homework activity. In the final stage, students are going to move into a decodable book. These books are anywhere from 94% to 100% decodable. And this is an opportunity for students to engage in extended text reading with a pre-reading activity, timed reading, and then a comprehension test is given at the end to assess comprehension on five different categories. So what do your classroom resources look like in Reading Horizons? So this is a typical, typical uh, grades one through three classroom kit. And the classroom kit includes a spelling supplement. It also offers scripted lessons. It includes all of your enrichment activities and practice pages. It includes your anchor charts. It includes your skill transfer cards when we start to move into that transfer stage. Your decodable readers are also included. And also all of your paper-based assessments and, reader, er, and reading records are included. Now, when it comes to the interactive software, um, the program, there are 100 lessons in the program that are provided um, both through the direct instruction and software. All of the lessons that are available through hard copy through the scripted lessons are also available digitally. And I want to make sure that you understand that this is not a what we call a drill and kill or drill and practice program. This is actually tutorial based instruction uh, using instructional branching and sequencing. So we have a combination of skill lessons, sight word lessons, and narrated tutorial lessons that also include uh, activities that assess proficiency both in isolation and in context. There is a 2200 vocabulary word wall uh, uh, utility that's built to the program where students have an opportunity to practice decoding these words, proving these words, they where they hear definitions, they, they also include parts of speech, context sentences. The decodable readers are also available digitally through the software. Uh, and are actually built into the lesson flow. So students are gonna move from the process of review, instruction, to dictation internally through activities into a, um, into a, a, a story uh, where students will then practice the fluency and also practice their uh, comprehension. And we assess comprehension, we, we, we grab that data, and we provide that data on your library reports. Student engagement is critical. So we want, we want students to, to, to enjoy reading. We want this experience to be engaging. We do this through a number of utilities. First of all, every student has their own personalized clubhouse. Uh, this serves as the launching site to all the utilities, including their reading library, their vocabulary, word wall building tool, and also their lessons. Each student has a personalized map where they are going to be displaying their trophies as they pass lessons, as they pass um, unit tests. We give and identify those awards in, in their um, in their clubhouse and it also includes a map that identifies where they are in their reading progress toward reading uh, toward reaching the end of the program. There are games in the program that reinforce decoding and encoding. These games are activated as they enter new chapters and are you actually activated and they're purchased with coins that students earn as they accomplish and finish lessons, tests, and, and uh, finish their reading assignments. There is a full library that students have access to where they can get to each of the read materials to review. Stories can be read to them after they have done their reading assignment. We also include an online store. So the coins that I spoke of earlier can be used to purchase all kinds of items that allow them to customize their clubhouse. And I wanna make mention that the games and stores are completely managed by the instructors. So you manage if, how, and when they have access to these fun tools. Finally, 
there is a pronunciation guide that students have access to that includes narrated mouth moves so the student can watch the mouth movement based on the sound or letter that they've selected. Animated cutaways show tongue placement, identify if it's a voice or voiceless sound. They can record their voice and practice pronunciation against the narrator. And there's also an animated letter formation feature here where they can pick and select any of the, of the um, uppercase or lowercase consonants and vowels and watch those formed. Diagnostics and assessments are critical. We've talked about earlier how critical it is to have these. Reading Horizons has a full battery of paper-based and digital um, assessments that include summative and benchmark assessments, digital diagnostic progress monitoring tools, sightword assessments. We have a Metametrics reading library assessment that's given throughout the program to assess comprehension growth as students move through this program. We also have lesson level checkups that can be assigned and given in less than three minutes that serve as a simple um, uh, uh, spot test or quiz to assess students' understanding of skills. This, these checkups can also be used to create groups for differentiated instruction when it comes to differentiation at the end of the lesson. So now I want to talk a little bit about data-driven instruction. Discovery includes a comprehensive data uh, program that tracks group and student performance at every level. Uh, at every level. And reports are structured in a, in a schema that starts at a summary level and allows you to drill down or dive down to various levels of detail. Notice here that as we drive into a student test report, uh, data is presented in a way that prioritizes what teachers should be looking at based on those colored orbs. And we also provide information specific to how they perform the skill in isolation, which is the uh, visual identification and marking and how well they were able to apply that skill in context, which is the reading piece. That's critical information that informs the instructor as to where to intensify or target instruction during differentiation. We also have uh, detailed benchmark testing um, and also reporting that allows students, or teachers rather, to identify how uh, students are doing at the feature analysis level. So this feature analysis really allow, allows teachers to see where to focus instruction and what features within that particular competency um, are in distress. So all of this data is provided um, and is used to inform instructors um, on how they can uh, best use, utilize the, the direct instruction and likewise um, how best to utilize the digital software as well. So differentiation is also really essential. Every lesson includes a differentiation table with instruction. Activities and materials are designed around level instruction, so students are going to be identified as on level, above level, or below level at the conclusion of each lesson. Leveling can be determined by the instructor using a variety of observational criteria or simple lessons, checkup data, and discovery includes tools which allow your, uh, those groups to be formed. And then based on the group that you've selected, the resources are, are organized around what should is appropriate for that particular group so your groups are automatically formed for you during this very important stage we call differentiation our professional development services are key so if you know um, whenever you're training in orton gillingham based programs um, professional development is key in most cases we can uh, train your staff to successfully implement this program in a day of training so we provide um, professional development that is on site. Professional development in today's world can also be done virtually. We also give teachers access to a module based online professional development course that provides ready access to all the skills, strategies and implementation recommendations throughout the, the, uh, throughout the year. Our program is researched and validated. I would encourage you to go to readinghorizons.com and, and go right to our landing site for our client reviews and research. If you want to see how we stack up uh, nationally, I would encourage you to pull up the Florida Center for Reading Research. That published report identifies how we met the mandates of effective reading instruction. So achieving results, very quickly. We know that evidence-based instruction with successful implementation, which goes to great tools and resources and professional development are gonna drive you to the expected outcomes that you've received. And hopefully we've given you some insights onto what we do. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to our guest speaker. Her name is Judy Kulang. Uh, Judy Kulang, I've known Judy Kulang for many years. Uh, she is a fantastic educator with over 35 years of experience. She's letter trained and is a letters trainer. 
She is also a certified in, uh, method coach and trainer with Reading Horizons, and she's now an educational consultant, having retired from uh, as a teacher about, what, three or four years ago. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy. Thank you, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here to share my thoughts and experiences about Reading Horizons with you, both as a reading teacher using this method with my students and as a consultant helping teachers implement it. I want to start by sharing a story about a little boy named Jay, who I came to know at the end of my first year of using Reading Horizons, which was many years ago. He was finishing up a pre-first year. That's how long ago it was when we still had pre-first for those kids who struggled in kindergarten. I didn't work with pre-firsters because the extra year was considered an intervention. So I had heard about Jay, even though I didn't see him. I'm sure you can think of a student just like him. There's a likable little boy who was just failing to thrive. Instruction didn't seem to stick. And he was distracted, not engaged, couldn't sit still, his teacher told me, because Jay had made so little progress in reading, even with this pre-first year intervention, his teacher had submitted paperwork to have him tested as soon as school began. His father asked me if I would tutor him over the summer, and I agreed. When we began, he knew some sound simple correspondences, but was confused about others and could only recognize a few high frequency words. After two years of our school's balanced literacy instruction, that's where he was. Head down, staring at the floor, he told me he didn't like to read. We started though at the very beginning with the very first simple concept. The name of the letter is A, the sound of the letter is A, and the upper and lowercase letter formation. His dad stayed to make sure he paid attention, holding, um, holding a Reese's Pieces uh, cup in his hand for a reward if Jay paid attention. After 18 hours of instruction over six weeks, with his dad working to support him other days, Jay's reading skills blossomed. I could actually see those new neural pathways growing and connecting, the ones that Matt told you about. He loved the hand motions during dictation, standing at the whiteboard to write, mark, and prove words. And he never let me forget to play the eraser game, which if you uh, attend to training, you'll hear more about. All those multi-sensory components, movement, speaking, listening, writing, reading, kept Jay engaged and coming back for more. He progressed quickly, learning the spelling patterns that represent the sounds and words. His reward for paying attention during our sessions now were words he could decode and spell and books he could successfully read with confidence and enthusiasm. Once school began in the fall, I kept him in my first grade intervention group, but he didn't need me very much longer. He was removed from the SPED testing list. Think of what could have been had he had evidence-aligned reading instruction based on the science of reading from the very beginning. So I've been teaching reading using one method or another since the mid 70s. I've experienced all of it, most recently whole language and its metamorphosis into balanced literacy. I completed my reading certification in 1991 when whole language strategies were still being endorsed. I had been taught during that time that learning to read was like learning to speak. But when I started my first job as a reading teacher, sitting in front of a group of second graders who could not decode the word math, I knew this instruction was failing them. The fallout of my district using a whole language program at the time was that we had a waiting list of students who needed help. Despite having my reading certification, I felt somewhat ill-equipped to meet their wide array of needs. And not much changed when the district switched to a balanced literacy program. It had some phonics, but was emphasized or taught in a way, was not emphasized and taught in a way that, that could produce results from my novice or my struggling readers. So seeing this drove me to go on my own professional development journey. I took Orton Gillingham classes, became a certified letters trainer under Louisa Motes. This new knowledge, along with the findings from the National Reading Panel at the time, made it clear what my students needed to thrive. And I went back to my classroom, back to my small groups. I used the best practice strategies I had learned in my depression, professional development to design lessons on my own that would meet the changing needs of my small, group of my small groups of students. 
but it was time consuming um, and often hit or miss, like throwing spaghetti at the wall. I sometimes think of students' knowledge as Swiss cheese, full of holes that I was trying to fill. I felt as if I was trying to reinvent the wheel every day. And although I know I did a good job with some students, I failed others. And I knew all of our reading teachers in my district were having similar challenges. So I was asked to find a program that all of us could use that would incorporate everything I knew students needed. Explicit, systematic, multi-sensory instruction presented with a planned sequence, leaving nothing to the imagination. Given that many of the reading teachers with whom I worked did not have the training that I had, I went in search of that program that would not only teach our students how to read, but also teach our teachers how to teach it. And that's what led me to Reading Horizons. I will never forget the excitement I felt when I attended my Reading Horizons training, actually with Matt Chrisman. It was like he had given me the golden ticket. I was so excited to return to my students to get started. And after a few weeks of implementation, I began to see improvement in their engagement, confidence, decoding, and spelling. And my confidence increased with the more success I saw. As the weeks continued, watching them up at the board, showing what they knew during dictation, learning and applying skills that were no longer here today, gone tomorrow. I was filling holes in my students' knowledge I hadn't known were there, and it was very exciting. Classroom teachers would come to my room to ask what I was doing differently. They would relate stories of my students teaching them and their peers the decoding strategies they had learned from me. Every reading teacher in my district who opted into the training experienced the same results with their students. We saw significant growth in our tier three intervention students, enabling many to no longer need our intervention and look more like the average or above student in their classroom. And the changes in our knowledge base as reading teachers has been huge. This is powerful. We felt then and continue to feel with each passing year more able to make a positive impact on student success. Now, as a consultant for other schools implementing Reading Horizons as part of their core instruction, I see even more growth on the part of students and their teachers because small group intervention is now consistent with the regular ed curriculum. As I help teachers implement Reading Horizons, I find they love it just as much as their students. They say they learn something every day that they wish they had known before. I believe that what makes Reading Horizons unique and works so well is this combination of the teacher knowledge base the program provides plus its powerful strategies that give kids ownership of their own learning. And together, they make reading accessible. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope my words are helpful to you in understanding the difference Reading Horizons can make for you and your students. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. That's awesome. And I, I wanted to, we're going to wrap this up here, guys. We're, we started a little bit late and I apologize because we had technical difficulties. But I want to, I want there to be a, a, a reflection period here as you've learned about what we do, if you learned about the science of reading. Here's my questions. Are you pleased with the reading progress your students are making? And are you sure they're prepared to handle the academic rigors that await them? Is your instruction aligned with the science of reading? And that really goes to these, these two questions here. Is it left brain intensive? Is it building those strong neural networks? Are you building automaticity in those word identification, which is absolutely critical in kindergarten and first grade? Are you applying evidence-based instructional strategies? Is your instruction explicit and systematic? Are you utilizing multimodal instructional strategies? Are you using daily diagnostics, observate not just the hard, uh, uh, the formative, or excuse me, the summative assessments or the formal tests, but daily using the diagnostics with corrective feedback so that you're able to observe and see and correct students um, as they demonstrate distresses and provide that remediation. And this is the big one. You have to daily transfer it to reading. Students are not going to naturally do that on their own. You've got to take what you're doing in isolation and you've always got to move them into reading every single day. Give them an opportunity to practice and apply that. So now we're just gonna turn this over. I know we've lost quite a few of you because we've gone a little bit long, but I'd like, if you have any questions, um, I'd like you to present those questions. Uh, we have Eric on the back end who's gonna be looking at those questions. If you wanna post um, your takeaways from today, and again, I apologize for uh, the 
technical difficulties. We didn't have all the information in front of me, but I hope that uh, the message came through nonetheless. There was one question that came up that I did want to address. There was a question on how is this different from other structured literacy programs, such as Wilson and such as Foundation? And I've, I've asked uh, Judy to stay on board if she wants to, um, to um, answer that. Sure. My, we have a lot of districts and a lot of schools that um, have either used Wilson or Foundations or were considering structured literacy and looked at Reading Horizons relative to Wilson. And both programs are awesome. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, Wilson and Foundation is a great program. It's based on Orton Gillingham Principles Instruction. It does explicit systematic instruction. It, is, um, it, it follows all the mandates of, of effective instruction. What differentiates the two of our programs is number one is that we have a blended learning option that they do not have, uh, which is critical, especially when it comes to differentiation. I would also tell you that we're a much easier to learn. Um, Wilson takes a bit more time to learn. Uh, you have to utilize every aspect of Wilson for it to be effective. Wilson in itself was not designed for small group foundations is the group version of Wilson, which was more designed for small one-on-one -on -one and small group. It's much more intensive. Um, Reading Horizons is a framework that can be integrated with anything else that you're doing with respect to your rich text, um, with respect to your anthologies, with respect to whatever programs. We have correlations to all the major reading programs so that you can integrate these resources very effectively. And honestly, the results that you get from Reading Horizons are much more quickly uh, seen than you would get with foundations. Even though they do essentially the same things, we get students there faster. That's the short answer to the question. Judy, you can ask and, and um, add anything to that that you might, might think important. No, I agree. The school I'm currently working with switched from Wilson where they were the foundations program um, because they just found it on, uh, not as uh, um, effective for them as they had hoped it would have been. And they're having much more success with the Reading Horizons and the teachers love using it. I can't say they ever told me they loved using foundations, but... Um, in, and in my particular area, I'm here on the East Coast. I'm actually in Delaware, um, and I work with clients in Pennsylvania. We have two very large districts in Pennsylvania this year that went, um, where we went head-to-head -head against foundations, and in both cases, district-wide, after exhaustive um, due diligence done by uh, reading specialists and, and, uh, and uh, those decision-making, the decision-making teams, they both chose Reading Horizons over the foundations. Are there any other questions that we can, uh, that we can address? Um, one question um, from Susan says, what makes this program multi-sensory? That is a great question. And I'm going to answer that in, at my level. And Judy, throw in whatever you want to because you're, you're very experienced with this. Um, what makes this multi-sensory is that we bring in kinetics. Uh, during the stage uh, of dictation, students are listening, hearing, speaking, and writing. There's movement involved. Um, they're not just sitting there listening. Um, we, we engage all the areas of the brain that are involved in accurate and fluent reading. So students are hearing, saying, speaking, and writing, and moving all at the same time. Judy, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, we use kinesthetic cues for the, um, for the, the short vowel sounds um, that help um, uh, support a student's uh, cognitive, their, their ability to be able to remember those sounds. And um, they're, they're just physically engaged. I'll, I, the best results I get is when I have students standing up at the board um, writing. So they turn to face you and they, uh, you give them the word using hand motions and they send the word back to you. You make sure they heard the right thing and then they turn around to the board and they write the word on the board and mark it as necessary. And they're, they're all engaged, constantly engaged, listening, speaking, reading and writing and moving. And I would add one more case, the kinesthetic component of this is crucial, especially when working with, with, with boys. Uh, girls tend to learn visually and auditorily. Boys learn through movement and touch. And since reading is a highly um, um, receptive process, there's not a lot of uh, expressive components that go with reading. It's reason why majority of our, of our students that are in tiered instruction, especially a majority of them are boys. And it's not because they necessarily have a reading disability, it's because of, what, of how we're teaching those foundational skills. And when not taught properly, it creates a, um, a spotty foundation that gives rise to all kinds of issues later on, especially when hit third, fourth, and fifth grade. So another question came up, um, if we are doing virtual school again, how is it will be to implement this virtually? Um, we have an entire, I didn't even cover that today, 
but Reading Horizons put together a fantastic virtual response plan. Um, that's one of the advantages of having um, not only digital software, but our lessons are also available virtually. So both if there, we have recorded lessons, whether you're doing asynchronous or synchronous instruction, um, we, we have the lessons available um, that are recorded that can be posted virtually. We, last year, we actually had um, our team of educators doing scheduling live lessons. So you could always log into a live lesson and see it taught. Um, the, all the physical goods, those are the, the enrichment pages and worksheets are available in student packs that can be attached and sent home to students. And if you combine that with the digital aspect, because it's tutorial based software, uh, you have a rich virtual distance learning solution. Yes, we found that to be extremely helpful as we uh, progress through this spring. <laughs> okay. Great. And if there are no other questions, um, and Erica will let me know if there are no other questions, uh, what we're going to do is throw up the last uh, poll. If you want more information about this program, um, please indicate so. Uh, we would be happy to put you in touch with an expert who can speak to its efficacy and also drive you to um, more information that you can uh, independently, where you can independently review this program. So please let us know if you are interested in receiving more information on this program. And on that note, um, I want to thank you again for being so patient with us through the technology issues that we had today. Um, I hope again that the message came through despite the technology problems and that you get excited, really excited about teaching reading in a way that reaches every learner in your classroom. Every learner in your classroom. And we're here to help if we can. Thank you.